Uh, tales of the Marvelous and News of the Strange, or in Arabic, Al Hikayat Al Ajiba, well, Akhba Al Hariba. Ajiba means wonderful, marvelous, strange, um, and the plural, Ajaib, was the term used to describe the non fiction genre of literature devoted to marvels of all kinds, um, including magic, the realms of the jinn, the wonders of the sea, strange flora and fauna. Um, great monuments of the past which couldn't be explained, automatons, hidden treasures, and uncanny coincidences. Um, and this story collection is full of that kind of thing. Um, there are no certainties about the chronology of this, but it looks as though this collection of what was originally 42 stories, but only 18 have survived in a manuscript found in Istanbul. Um, it looks as though this Manuscript was the stories were originally compiled probably in the 10th century. The more and more I look at it, the more probable that ori the original guess of scholars seems. Although the manuscript itself is a copy probably of the 14th century, and there are a few tiny signs of contamination from uh, centuries after the 10th century, but tiny stuff. It, it's not like the Arabian Nights, where so much of the Arabian Nights is full of Mamluk and Ottoman material. Um, the I'll come to the discovery of the manuscript in a minute. Anyway, uh, in 1956, a German scholar published an Arabic edition of the text, uh, printed in Beirut, but ed published by a German publisher. And then this was followed in 1999 by a German translation that was addressed primarily at a scholarly audience, and it looked at questions of philology and, and tale types and things like that. Um, but... Otherwise, these wonderful stories have been almost totally neglected, and Malcolm Lyons' translation for Penguin Classics is the first time they have appeared in English. Although the tales are full of wonders and marvels and magic and bizarrery, I, I think in many cases there's a hidden pious purpose behind the stories, and might come to that later. Um, <clears throat> What, when I wrote the introduction, it, it was a slightly rushed job. I don't think it was a bad job, but I, I did skip some stuff, and I failed to notice what an interesting man Helmut Ritter, uh, 1892 to 1971, was. He was the man who found this manuscript in the Hagia Sophia uh, Library. And um, he has been described by the late, great Ulrich Harman as the greatest German Orientalist of the 20th century. Ritter was the star pupil of, um, of Karl Heinrich Becker, who was a very grand man in Weimar days in Germany. Becker was the top German Arabist and, and uh, indeed an important minister of culture in, in, in Prussia and a big wheel. And Ritter was his star pupil. And Ritter seemed to be destined for great things. And he was, uh, he was the set number of a professorship in Hamburg. Hamburg is significant because that is where the Warburg Institute originally was, and Ritter quickly associated himself with the people at the Warburg Institute in the years prior to their flight from Germany to London and London University, where, having survived the Nazis, they're now under threat from the admin of London University. But that's <laughs> another sad story. Uh, during the First World War, Ritter served as an interpreter in the Ottoman Empire, interpreting for the German troops there and also for the Ottoman officers. He had you know, Arabic, Persian, Tur uh, Turkish. Why would one not? He picked up languages so quickly. Destined for great things, but then in, uh, let me think, uh, 1925, he was convicted of homosexuality, went to prison for a year, lost his job, uh, a total disaster, uh, he had friends among German Orientalists who found him a job. Sorry, let me go back to the Warburg Institute. That's rather important. He, he stayed in contact with the Warburg scholars for the rest of his life. And with Fritz Saxel, who was for a time head of the Warburg Institute, worked for decades on Picatrix, which is also known in Arabic as Hayat al-Hakim, or goal, goal of the Sage, um, an extremely sinister magical text. Uh, I find this interesting because I've been attending classes at the Warburg where we've been trying to translate it. Ritter and Saxel translated it. It's kind of totemic text for the Warburg Institute because it's, uh, it, it's full of these extraordinary magical uh, spells and so on, which, are, which carry evidence of the survival of the dark side of antiquity. And Picatrix is a kind of, it's a kind of text which sort of precedes Donna Tartt's The Secret History. It's that kind of sinister and potentially lethal uh, and uh, take on antiquity. Anyway, um, 
German Orientalists found him a job in Istanbul, where he was, I think they created a job for him as representative of the German Orientalist Society in Istanbul. He was the institute there. And there he devoted himself to chasing out obscure and undiscovered manuscripts uh, in the many mosque libraries in Istanbul. Sometime in the late 1920s, he found the manuscript of Tales of the Marvelous, or what was left of it, and didn't reveal it immediately. And then in 1933, Becker died, and Rissa must have thought, I've got a chance of coming back to Germany and, and getting the professorship either in Berlin, which is where Becker was, or just possibly in Hamburg. And at that point, Ritter revealed that he'd found this amazing manuscript. I think that may, that may not be a coincidence. Unfortunately, in 1933 was also the year the Nazis came to power, and Ritter's chances of going back to Germany uh, were effectively finished. Later on, after the war, he does go back to Germany. Um, the only other thing I'd say about Ritter is that uh, this was just a sideline. He kept finding all sorts of extraordinary and important texts, and his main interest was actually Sufism and the Mevlevi order. And he died, well, as I say, in 1971. Um, now, before I stop uh, for a while, um, a few words about the translator. It's really his book, of course. And the translator was Malcolm Lyons, who was born in 1929, and he's therefore 85. Um, and therefore, because of his great age, really rather immobile and so unable to be with us this evening, I, I did try to persuade him to come to London to this and to other events. But he's a very great man. He was formerly Thomas Adams Professor of Arabic at Cambridge. That's the top Arabic job in Cambridge, corresponding to the Lordian Professorship in Oxford. He started out as a classicist and taught classics at Cambridge for a while before deciding there's too much work being done in the classics. There's more space if I move into Arabic where I can do the same kind of textual criticism. And in, he, but he still has great, he has an enormous library of alert classical texts uh, in his house. Um, he's, his major work while he was a professor was a three volume study of the Arabian epic. It took, took years and years of work. Uh, but he's probably best known and indeed will be revered and famous for many decades to come for his translation of The Thousand and One Nights, which he did for Penguin and was published in 2008. Subsequently, he turned to Tales of the Marvelous, which in the Arabic is 505 pages long. In between rounds of golf, he's very much a son of St. Andrews, it took him 18 months to translate, which is pretty amazing. He reads and speaks Arabic more easily and quickly than most people read and speak English. Um, and that book was published, this book here, that is, was published in November of last year. Brilliant. Um, well, you've actually brought up the, one of the things I'd like to ask you about straight away. Um, but before that, I just want to say a few things about Robert and my, what mm. I owe him. Um, because Robert, um, while being an Orientalist and a scholar, as you've heard, is also interestingly imaginatively close to some of this material. In way, <laughs> and what's coming? <laughs> and um, I recommend to you very strongly his Memoirs of a Dervish. Um, so we have here, that is an autobiography, we have here someone who has sampled the um, mysticism and wonders and the marvels of the system of belief at its, at its fountainhead a while ago. So um, then... Um, He's been, for, for me and for many people, many of his readers, the source of extraordinary insights and pleasure, wonderful entertainment. So there's an anthology of classical Arabic literature, the, um, um, the night and horses and the desert. There's the book that I first came across Robert's um, work through this book, which is The Companion to the Arabian Nights, which came out, which year was that, Robert? Uh, oh, God, I can't remember, actually. 80s, <laughs> perhaps? 80s. Yes. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to review it for the Times yes. Literary Supplement. And that set me off on, on, on the path of realizing that these Arabic tales of enchantment actually were in dialogue with our traditions, our fairy tale traditions in Europe, in ways that had not been properly examined. So I've since then really been working on it. And you, you um, opened the path to that. And I wanted to... We, we are the same generation. And when way back in the 60s... Um, I went to hear some beat poets read. And one of them, and I feel that there's an affinity too in Robert's imagination, 
um, with some of those movements. And, um, and, this, and this beat poet, well, I'll tell you his name in a moment, got up and said, my name means the announcer, the pathfinder, the way. And this was Gregorio Annunzio Corso, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is Italian. And, um, and, I th and Robert, I think, really does have that, those dimensions in his, in his work. He's very deeply involved. So I'm going to ask you a frivolous question first, but maybe an important one, mm. which is in the introduction, mm. you encounter a Ginny. Yeah, <clears throat> I, that was a hostage to fortune, slipping that sentence in. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, I can't remember it. I, 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 was, I was doing a radio broadcast, and I, I was talking about the supernatural in the Middle East or something, and I said, well... I was in a place where gins and so on appeared all the time. Uh, I can't remember if I saw one. My friend, who happened to be listening to the radio and who was with me in Algeria, said, oh, yes, you did. It was in the form of a cat. Um, I have no memory of it. Uh, but I think the more substantial point there is that um, I did spend time in Algeria in a quasi-medieval environment of a Sufi monastery, a Zawiya. And there, quite literally, the supernatural, literally, every day, was an everyday experience. Uh, people walked through walls, people had ecstasy, smoke rose from their hands, mandalas dripped water. Just all the time, it kept coming at one. Um, and I can't deny what I experienced there. And it, it occurred to me this morning, this puts me very much on a level with the man who put this text together, or men or women who put this text together, as well as their readership. Like them, I believe in the supernatural and coincidences and the uncanny power of coincidences and all that stuff. Well, one of the things that comes out of the stories is this dimension of astonishment, but it is related also to a spirit of inquiry. Mm. So, and it rather relates to our English word wonder. Wonder is both standing back and marvelling. It's also I wonder, I inquire into. And you do... You do make a point in the introduction that some of these stories, such as Descending into the Bottom of the Sea, are related to a kind of travel literature or a proto-scientific literature of actually inquiring into the, the, the creation, which you say is the creation of Allah and therefore mm. needs to be inquired into. Yeah, uh, quite a few of these stories do draw on the non-fiction um, genre of Ajay Abul Bach, Wonders of the Sea, these are tales brought back by sailors and merchants, not all about the sea, quite often they're about India or, or the, island, the Southeast Asian islands. Um, the wonders of the sea sort of tends to cover it. It, it, and indeed that phrase is used here even when they're talking about wonders in India and Sumatra and the sort of human-headed trees and the dog-headed men and all that kind of stuff is found in non-fiction and then filters into fiction. I, the thing I would say about this, and this is, this is very much Islamic, I don't know if it's so true in Western wonder literature, is that uh, this has a pious purpose. It comes over very strongly in the Sinbad stories that Sinbad keeps marvelling at what he sees and he gives thanks to God, God for his inventiveness and the huge profusion of things that God can invent to wonder at the universe. You're enjoined to do that in the Quran. You must wonder at what you see. You wonder at the sky, the seas, and all that God has created. It's very pious. Do you want to make a, look a little bit and explore what the relationship is to magic? I mean, you said the supernatural, but the supernatural is sort of larger than the category of magic in a way, because the supernatural is also metaphysical. Um, well, there it goes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> the, the spirit of the gym. I, I'm not sure what you're asking. Yeah, but what, what I'm asking is that the, the wonders of the world are created by God and yeah. therefore deserving of our respect and our inquiry and mm. our curiosity. But the jinn and the mechanisms of the stories, the sort of eruption mm. of, of coincidences and stunning things and people turning into animals and all that, which makes them so entertaining and surprising, the quality of surprise, mm. that, that's, that's more to do with enchantments of a magical kind rather than a metaphysical kind. And, and, I mean, I keep on being asked, and so I'm going to put this question to you about fairy tales, isn't it bad for people to believe in these things? <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel <laughs> that I've suffered from believing in the supernatural and so on, um, though I, I don't think I'm particularly gullible. Um, no, I, I can't respond directly to it. What keeps cropping up in my mind is I was at a seminar, at the, no, it was a seminar at the Royal Ace, Electric Royal Asiatic Society last night where someone was talking about the occult philosophy in the Islamic world and 
talking about magical texts such as the Qayyat al-Hakim, I've already mentioned, or the Shams al-Ma'arif, uh, son of Gnosis. And these magical texts have a complete disconnect with the stories. Uh, the actual sorcerer's text, the real practicing stuff, has almost has no references to jinn at all. You can't just summon up a jinn and force him to do things and rub lamps or open flasks and out they pop. It just doesn't happen like that in occultism. The, the, the world of magic mm. in fiction is self-contained without reference to what actually was going on in the medieval Arab world. That's quite strange. Uh, so remind me of the question. Yeah, no, no, it's just, just, just the dark side of magic. I mean, you actually, oddly enough, mentioned it when you were talking about the Warburg. A dark looking side. at the Yes. So, so sometimes fairy tales come under criticism that they're too full of witches and that they, you know, they, they, they pervert children's minds to be scared of, of the supernatural. I mean, this is a little bit of a reductive kind of Dawkins-like argument, but actually it's not only neo-Darwinists like Dawkins who bring it up. It's, a, it's the sort of at school teachers and so forth. They're sort of worried about these dimensions of the improbable and the unlikely and, and, and the mechanistic of magic. Uh, two things embedded there. Firstly, and you'll have to remind me of the second bit in a minute. Uh, firstly, um, what you don't get in the Arab world is the, the whole business of deals with the devil, and if you sell your soul, you'll sell your shadow. You're, you're, in, you're, you, you, you're going to have a very bad time. It's probably this story is going to have an unhappy ending. There's no feeling of that at all when people are dealing with the jinn in the Arabian Nights, or even, and most extraordinarily, in one of these stories, which one is it? Sul and Shamul, I think. Um, the, the Iblis, the devil, appears at, towards the very end of the story, and, and the jinn have brought the two parted lovers before him, and Iblis says, what's the problem? Oh, I can sort this out. And he does sort it out. Completely benign figure. Absolutely bizarre. <laughs> um, and I think there's another story where Iblis is quite a neutral character. There is no feeling of Faustian pacts leading to doom. That whole business of dealing with magic being necessarily evil is not there. Mm. Uh, but the other sort of question that you've got embedded there is... Um, is fantasy a bad thing? Uh, I think it's extraordinarily naive to think that fantasy is just fantasy. Fantasy is almost always about reality. And when Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and Philip Pullman and the rest appear to be writing about alternative worlds, of course they're not. They can't really. They're writing about the world we live in. Otherwise, their fiction would be completely irrelevant. And I've written fantasy novels, and they've... Well, frankly, they've been starkly autobiographical. You know, it's, it's not like I've created them out of nothing to, for, for, for no point at all. I like very much a quotation from actually a German scholar in which he says that the wonders in fairy tales are there to prove that the impossibility of, real, that the, that the impossibility of reality can be overcome or the intolerability of reality can be overcome, the unbearable nature yeah. of reality can be overcome. They're sort of throwing out a line to hope. Yeah. But... Um, there's a difference, isn't there, between these stories and the Arabian Nights in this respect, I mean, many other respects too. And maybe you could just um, give us a little bit more information on the relationship. There are, some stories are the same as the Arabian Nights, but they're told rather differently, but they're the same material. Um, eight of them, I think, is that right? But, but on this point of morality, they are quite different, I think, the two books. That hadn't particularly stuck me. I, I have been looking at this question, of course. It, it, it's terrible. One of the important things about this story collection is, first, it's got a lot of stories that weren't in the Arabian Nights and are in no other story collection. But the second thing that's important about it, and perhaps even more important, is that it does have stories that are in the Arabian Nights, only very slightly different from the versions in the Arabian Nights, which is terrific for people who are studying the Arabian Nights and how it was put together and how the, the people who put the final the version we have, the earliest version we have now, together. And just, just, Pick it up, uh, because this is 10th century and not much monkeyed about since, whereas the version of the Arabian Nights, the oldest substantially surviving manuscript, is late 15th century. Um, so here we've got these at least six stories, of which we have an earlier version than that in the Arabian Nights. So, of course, I've sort of gone through and looked page by page, line by line, how they differ, expecting to come to some big good conclusion that the, the Arabian Nights is much more professionally done or, or they've condensed it or, or they've elaborated on it or they've misunderstood. And I failed to come to any conclusion at all. There is no consistency. 
in, in some respects, the versions in the Arabian Nights are more elaborate and better and more sophisticated. In other respects, they're actually inferior. But sometimes, sometimes the, one of the striking things about Tales of the Marvelous is the amount of haste it's written in, uh, like they couldn't even be bothered with the grammar of it properly, and they keep forgetting how the plot is going. Mm-hmm. So the, the stories of the six crippled and disastrously disabled men who all come to unhappy ends, um, five of them tell their stories, and the king says, well, that's jolly good, I've really enjoyed this, and here's some robes of honour and some money, and, and go away, and uh, I've had enough now. And then the glass... Uh, Glass cellar is introduced, and he tells his story, at which point the king said to all six of them, well, that's jolly good, and have robes on and money. And, you know. <laughs> and, and then again in the story of the that's prince and the 40 one. slave girls, uh, the prince mm. who's hidden in the castle sleeps with the first of the uh, 40, sorry, not slave girls, 40 girls, sleeps with the first of them, who's a sorceress, and he deflowers her, and, and she keeps quiet about it. And then night after night, he deflowers all the other 39. And then... At the very end, he, he comes round to her again, forgetting he's done so, finds her to be a virgin, tells his life story, deflowers her again. Complete incompetence. It just shows um, that you know, these stories are red hot off the hand of the scribe. Did, did you ever consider um, amending these? I mean, I did wonder about... I did wonder about it, whether, uh, because you have no footnotes. So. No, uh, that would be Malcolm's decision. And yeah, the one thing I should say, that again, the tales of the 40, 40 girls, the prince and the 40 girls, uh, he keeps changing the gender yes. within sentences. So it starts out as a he and it turns into a she, or he's sleeping with he or she's sleeping. It just gets it wrong. Uh, it's... Malcolm has quietly corrected that because otherwise, you know, you're reading some ridiculously scholarly text where, you know. But I, but I think this raises another so a, a sort of a point. I want to come back to the morality point, the differences between the Arabian Nights and this. But just on, on this opening up from this, um, I think there is a point here about how these stories are transmitted. And you tell a wonderful story in Companion to the Arabian Nights mm. about visiting Damascus. Do you remember? And you hear, you you see as. You hear a storyteller in the market, hmm. in the souk. You don't remember? I don't remember. Okay, no. well, it's all right. I, what, but I've got a terrible one memory. No one, no, one doesn't remember what one writes oneself. No. So, 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 um, so Robert's in the market, in the souk in Damascus, and he sees a storyteller working, and he's in the cafe, and he's blind, and he's telling a story marvelously well. And then he goes off, and two days later, he sees the storyteller in the corner of another cafe, and he's reading his notes. I, this, this, is, this is you, it's not me. I, I definitely didn't do that. I, I would remember that. Now, I, anyway, I, it, well, I, okay. I think from right. your review of my book that we do differ on one thing. Yes. I am increase, When I wrote The Guide to the Arabian Nights, I was sort of, well, oh, this is maybe it's, maybe it's sort of oral, maybe it's the sort of the stuff that storytellers work with. And so I devoted a whole chapter to mm. storytelling and performances in marketplaces like the... the Places of extinction in Marrakesh and so on. Increasingly, as I look and look at this and at the Arabian Nights, I think, well, it's it's not a hundred percent, but I think more and more this is a literary work. Uh, it, it 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 draws on literature and it is designed for readers rather than listeners. It, it there are all sorts of examples of stories it's taken from earlier. Not many, but some stories are. Two of these stories of the six men are actually taken from anthologies of classical Arabic poetry, uh, and there are a couple of other stories that come from pre-existing, highly literary sources. And looking at the other aspect of it, we're now finding more and more manuscripts of the Arabian Nights. About 50 or so have turned up since really? Muhsin Mahdi uh, produced his edited edition. And for some of them, as you know, have readers' annotations yes. in the margins. Uh, what happens is that readers will go to a circulating library of the sort that I remember from childhood. The, the Boots used to have a circulating library selling popular fiction. or Not selling, lending popular fiction. What happens is people will go to a scribe and, and pay to borrow a book for a week or two weeks, and often they wrote in the margins, God, this is rubbish, or, or <laughs> I read this already, or something like that. Uh, so we're getting a, some sense of the readership. Um, but it is a readership. I'm increasingly I, I don't to... deny it's a readership. I yeah. think there's, there's just an exchange between them. Yeah. The fact that this is so, as it were, hastily done, yeah. it seems to me that it's not been, been prepared for 
publication in quite the way. I mean, I know it's a manuscript. Mm. They've been prepared for that, carefully produced. If you look at the... Sorry, this is rather technical, but I mean, if you look at the Wortley Montague manuscript of the Arabian Nights mm. in the Bodleian, it's absolutely perfect. Mm. You know, it's completely done. It's obviously done as a sort of beautiful presentation copy for someone to read. Let's look at it. But I, th- but I don't know what this one... Looks- anyway, it's bes- but I think that the larger point is that there's quite a... Um, a record within the stories themselves of the stories being told and then being responded to and then being t- taken away and retold. I mean, the, you know, there's a kind of going from the voice to the page to the voice to the page and back again. And I think that relates to the moral question. So what was the function of the stories? So when you mentioned about you know, the, uh, 40, um, the 40 um, the girls and they're all pregnant and so forth, mm. um, that story is, has a similarity to one in the Arabian Nights, yes. where it is told very differently because he has been punished. Yes, it's better so, than the Arabian Nights. So, so in, in, in the story of the third dervish? I can't remember, it's yeah, one, anyway, of dervish one, one of the dervishes. Yeah. So it begins, and he's only got one eye, and we, and we discover that he's got one eye because mm. he's been kicked, because the cycle of his mis- misdeeds with mm. the women eventually leads to the magic horse, which kicks him in the eye to punish him. Mm. And, and of course, that's symbolic, too, that he's been, he's been deprived of half his sight for having, as it were, sinned mm. with, his, with his spirit. It's a sort of element of, of printing on the body, the, the, the defects. But here, he gets away with it. Yes, yes. I mean, joyously. Well, I, I think it's, it, no, it's really very unsatisfactory, you know. He walks through the door, and there's the, the, there's a, there's a princess disguised as a horse who flies him away, and then introduces him to a sister. It's all ridiculous and <laughs> frankly anticlimactic compared with the Arabian Nights version, which is much better in this particular case. But that's not always the case. And if this were an oral collection, how on earth did the storyteller manage with Arus el Arais, or Bride of the Brides, an extraordinary tale of a woman who kills everyone she sleeps with, whether he be a jinn or a man? Uh, she kills hundreds. Uh, extraordinary tale of wits of misogyny carried to such an extent that it, it goes beyond misogyny. It's something else. Uh, wild fantasy. But the t- point about that tale is it's so complex. So th- th- there's a king who loses his daughter, and then there's a vizier who worries that the king is known, never going to recover from the grief. Then he finds a man who finds another man who tells him, I know a man who can tell you the story, and the man tells the story, and it's about a man on a desert island, and he, oh, God. Uh, and then there's a story within that, and then there's a story within that. Yeah. Can you imagine trying to tell that in the marketplace and sort of stopping after about 10 pages worth? The following day, you thought, hang on a moment, who's telling the story now? And you to claw back to get to where you were in the story, who's telling what. It's, it's, it's but that, isn't that the sort of delirium of, of listening? Isn't that the fun of it? That you're listening and I, you get lost. Isn't that it? I, I, I would love to see the storyteller mm. could pull that one off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but the Arus um, Alara is a, is a fantastic mm. sort of fugue of invention about women's wiles. Yeah. So it belongs in a very strong literary tradition of writing stories warning against the mischief that women bring upon everyone. Mm. Now, in the Arabian Nights, this is also the theme, because that's what Scheherazade is fighting. Mm. The Sultan thinks that all women are deceitful. They're all Arus al Ravra. Is that how you pronounce her name? Arais. Arais, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, so... But in the Arabian Nights, we have the counter-narrative from Sherazad, and that provides the morality. She, she tries to win the sultan over to change his mind. Women aren't all deceitful. They can be deceitful sometimes, but maybe it's because they're in love or because they're poor. Or, so there's, the, <laughs> there's a kind of morality. Oh, yeah. So what do you make of that aspect, that there's no, it, there's no counter-instructive um, power going through the this book, this collection. It, 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 it is lacking a frame story, and I think that is a pity. But I'm not buying this version of the Arabian Nights um, for two reasons. Firstly, um, the stories that Sherazade tells, an awful lot of them, about how awful women are and how they will get away with adultery if they can. Or worse, crafty Delilah is actually a murderess, and I think they're probably one or two other examples. So a lot of the stories Sherazad is telling to Sharia say, watch out for women, they're dangerous. Uh, you're, you're quite right. Um, and the other reason is that um, at the very end of the, the, the Thousand and One Nights, it's not like Sharia, 
Oh, well, that's great. I've listened to so many stories and I now feel much better. I now understand how wrong despotism is and I now understand <laughs> the rights of women and, uh, you know, I'm a converted feminist and I, I changed my ways. You've been a very good therapist, Sherazad. He doesn't do that at all. He forgives Sherazad. You know, the moral gap between our sensibility and whoever put that story collection together is enormous. Well, some, some of the reviewers have preferred this book because it's so immoral, because it's so, so deliriously, you know, excitably mm. ag- against all um, trends of morality. They like, I mean, it's, it's much liked for that reason. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, there's another aspect in terms of um, sort of knowledge, and um, that not just the, um, the geographical and the wonders and the scientist, scientific inquiries, mm. But there's a very interesting sort of historical perspective that's actually very different from the knights. Um, and that's partly because there, there are Christians in yes. this book, and they figure very prominently. Yes. And there are even um, mention, there are sort of invocations of different elements, of different people from the Bible in ways that doesn't happen in the knights. Mm. Some of them may be in the Quran, the people from the Bible, but nevertheless, it's a very, rather different. And there's a sort of deep time perspective. We see Adam in one of the stories. And Adam is writing on clay tablets. He's the sort of first writer. Um, so the, do you want to elaborate on this idea of how, how the time is seen, how history is seen in the book? Yeah, I, w- one thing is these, this story collection is so much older. Um, and yeah. therefore, it's closer to the Umayyads. They're far more st- featured. The Umayyad caliphs and one of the governors in Basra feature much more prominently than you'd find in the Arabian Nights, which is only notionally in the Basid period, effectively in the Mamluk period. It's... Um, Closer in the sense it's very tolerant about Shiism. Indeed, it's enthusiastic about mm. Ali and yes. Abu Talib and so mm. on, w- without being hostile to Sunnis, and that reflects an earlier period. And then, yes, it's, it, it's terrib- the Christians are terribly prominent here in, in a way that they aren't in the Arabian Nights. Mm. You see them in the Arabian Nights, sometimes rather hostilely presented. Mm. Yes. Uh, Rowan Williams in The New Statesman commented on a general, a very good review, a general background of unex- unanxious acceptance of religious diversity. Um, one of the nice ironies in several stories is the way in which the Christian and Byzantine past appears as an opulent and exotic world, rather like the oriental fantasies of later Westerners. Yeah. Irwin argues that the author was well informed about Christian practices. It would be more accurate <coughs> to say that it is just the kind of knowledge about this that a 19th century writer of adventure stories might have of Islam or Hinduism. He knows a bit of the vocabulary, enough to give a flavour of alien splendour, but not much more. Uh, Rowan Williams absolutely right, and sort of coming back to look at the stories and tales of the marvellous, yes, the Christians are there a lot, but they really are strange. Um, at the beginning of the story of Mahliya and Mahub, uh, the, gen- the Umayyad general who's just conquered Egypt summons the hermit Matrun, and Matrun being summoned to explain the existence of an enormous building at Ain al-Shams, or Heliopolis, sets out, and he puts on a belt of red leather embroidered with crosses of yellow silk, uh, silk and fastened with a band of white silk around his forehead, and from this he hung a cross of red gold between his eyes and his neck, and then he attaches lots of cups of wine to his horse. So you really know this is a Christian who's turning <laughs> up. And throughout the stories, through the treasure-hunting stories and some of the other stories, Monks are the, the guardians of ancient knowledge, and, and, yes. and, and indeed, mm. statues of monks protect um, uh, what a sort of monastery with no, 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 no entrance where treasure is concealed. Uh, the, yes, it's a sort of, there's a yes. word I wanted to introduce this evening automatonophobia, fear of statues. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> But they come in the nights too. That cro- yes. knock, it, um, slice your head off if you approach something precious. The body of Solomon, for example, on his beer. Mm-hmm. Well, shall we open it to the? I have one. So do start thinking. I don't know if we have a microphone. Do we have a microphone? Would, is it going to work? So do do start thinking. I'm just going to ask while while you gather your thoughts. Put your arm, your hands up. I just want to ask Robert to comment on one thing, which is the poetry. Um, can't comment. Um, I, I, frankly, my eyes tend to slide over it. Um, it's mediocre, I think. It's usually anonymous and untraceable. You, you can't assign an author to this poetry. And it doesn't seem to me to move the action on. But still, in both the Arabian Nights and in Tales of the Marvelous, people must have enjoyed this a lot. And 
some of the stories are hardly more than vehicles for poetry. Yes. Mm. Sewell and Shamul, where mm. Sewell goes looking for Shamul. And he laments all the time yes, and yes. he weeps his tears. And she does he too. cites poetry and then the monks he meets, meets lots of monks, cite poetry back at him. You know, it's just a vehicle for poetry. And they obviously got a lot more out of it than we today in translation do. Questions? Yes, yes, yeah. Were, were there any extant illustrations or drawings that accompanied those texts at the time? Uh, no. Um, let me think. Um, there are no, there's only one manuscript that tells the marvellous. It's unillustrated and it's dodgy handwriting and lacunary. And, you know. um, the Arabian Nights was not illustrated as a whole until the 19th century when I think the Qajars commissioned it. And, there's, and, one man, there's one in uh, Manchester. Yes, there's, no, I'm coming to that. Yes. The individual stories uh, were just a handful of really crude illustrations, which are so grotty that, you know, Penguin Classics would never think of using one on the dust jacket or anything. They, they, they're, they're really childlike. They're, they're very uninteresting. And actually, don't tell you anything about the story. They, you know, they don't convey action. The, the things that are well illustrated in the medieval Arab world are treatises on automata, treatises on horsemanship, Oh, and the fictional uh, work of Al Hariri, the Makamat uh, series of, oh, it's rather difficult to explain, uh, of virtuoso performances by a rogue who's conning people out of money by using his spectacular command of Arabic. That was a real. Oh, and Khalila Wadimna, the other great classic work of Arabic literature, animal fables put together by Ibn al Mukaffa. The problem with the Arabian Nights, its problem was that it was not regarded as serious literature. It's not good literature, it's not written in proper Arabic, therefore it's certainly not worth illustrating, mm. which is expensive. Actually, I disagree about the Manchester one. I think the Manchester illustrations are quite... But, mm. but the, there's another... The, the related manuscripts of things like the Alexander Romance the, mm. the, um, and other... Uh, the Al Kazwini. Kazwini. Al Kazwini, um, also a tale of wonders and invent, sort of inquiries and exploration with some, I mean, for example, the tree you mentioned that bears human heads that speak, that yeah. turns up as a trope, yeah. or the, um, the, under, the undersea marvels. You, there are some, there's a beautiful manuscript in the Bodleian with some of these yeah. discoveries in the world, which is a, a, a book of curiosities with maps and then wonderful illustrations. So I think, in a sense, you know, the high-low, it, mm. some of the motifs are in high manuscripts as yeah. well. Yeah, and Sorry, Ar Arusala Rice has this bit where um, they slipped in how Alexander, or a king, who's not called Alexander, it's called something else, but it's obviously Alexander, is trying to build Alexandria, and every time he starts building it, jinn come out of the sea and destroy it. Mm -hmm. um, so the solution, apparently, is to have lots of figurines of owls created and put into chests and floated out to sea, and that deters the jinn. So that, that, that is a straightforward steal from Diodorus Siculus. Yes. So, you know, it's high literature yes. infesting what is popular, semi-popular literature. We have, Sorry. I think, one the seven here, one here, and then you. Um, the back, the back up there, yes. Uh, I'm interested, between the 10th century and the discovery of the manuscript in Hagia Sophia, I mean, were these was there a, were the manuscripts available in Arabic in the Arabic world? Were the stories carried forward by in an oral tradition? Were they completely lost? And then from the nineteen more recently, are they currently read in Arabic anywhere in the Islamic world? Um, they are completely lost. There, there is no external references to them. There are no other manuscripts of it. This is like a text preserved in amber. It was intended to arrive at the Arabian Nights and it never got off the ground. Um, within the last month or so, an Arabic agent was inquiring whether, um, you know, whether there was an Arabic version of it. <laughs> um, it yes, there is, but it was published by a German publisher. Um, but, so I, I, I rather suspect the publication in English is going to re lead to a reissue in Arabic. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm going out to talk about it in Dubai in a few weeks' time, and I'm sure it will lead on to other things. Mm. I mean, well, it is quite striking that when Edward Lane has that chapter about going around listening to stories mm. in Cairo, he doesn't mention a single story from the Arabian Nights being told by the... They're almost all epic, yes. ep epic poems or epic accounts of history that he remembers the storytellers telling. Mm. Uh, this here, and then... 
Thanks. Uh, you mentioned epic. I was thinking myth here as well. The linkage, is there any linkage between these tales and the Grail myths and the Arthurian cycle? Uh, and, uh, and indeed, are there myths in, in the Arabian world that are different from fairy tales and wonder tales as we understand them? Oh, what a question. Um, as it happens, while I was working on the, writing the introduction of this and so on, at the same time I was writing a novel featuring Sir Thomas Mallory and English folk tales and so on, uh, and the whole legendary lore of medieval and indeed Western Europe. Um, so I would have noticed if there was any possible link between the Grail, Merlin, mm. all the rest of it, and, these, and there isn't. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's, there's not, not a trace of a linkage there. As for whether there's an Arab mythology outside this kind of story, um, not that I can think of off the top of my head, though if I thought longer, maybe something would occur to me. No. At the back then. Hi. Um, Marina, I just wanted to say I'm a huge fan of your work, um, but I, my question was for Robert. Um, I was fascinated by uh, what you were saying about the supernatural being part of the everyday life when, uh, I think you said, when you're in Al Algeria. Um, and I wonder what you thought about that in relation to the supernatural existing in this country. Do you think that sort of that's still around, or do you think that was very specific to that time and place that you were in then? That's a hard question. I, I did feel... It did seem to be topographically limited. Um, the first few minutes I set foot in this Sawir and Mustagnum, I started to feel extremely strange. You know, it was just like that. You move into this building and whoosh, things... T the, and I moved into a different kind of universe where different kinds of things happen. I did experience strange things afterwards, but diminishingly so, and, and I sort of rather lament this in the final pages of Memoirs of a Dervish, that as I grow older, there seem to be fewer and fewer gaps between reality, where, where one can see the supernatural, uh, fewer and fewer bizarre coincidences, less and less bouts of ecstasy. Um, so, yes, I, I think there must be certain places which are full of strange powers, and that, that Bloomsbury is not particularly one of them. <laughs> <laughs> We have a question there. Um, I, was, I was thinking back of when you mentioned how everything uh, in these tales that we marvel at is made by God. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's um, never in these tales um, an instance of the devil or of malignant forces creating these um, maybe illusions or maybe just these marvels in order to um, mislead or, uh, or lead the characters astray. Um, perhaps like in you know, more medieval romances in which the devil is quite clearly trying to um, lead the knights or you know, the good doers astray? Uh, yes, I think probably there are. It's quite hard to think off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. but, um, in the city of Brasses, uh, remember they conjure the, in order to prevent them, they go in the... Remember in the city of Brasses? No. It's in the, in, in the, in the Arabian Nights, not mm -hmm. in yours. I'm thinking, let me think, um, Abu Muhammad the Lazy, mm. uh, there, there's a scrawny ape that he purchases oh, yes. for a mm. tiny amount of money. That, that's a sinister illusion, I suppose. In fact, the scrawny ape is a great jinn, and he cons uh, Abu Muhammad, after Muhammad is, Abu Muhammad has become a rich man, uh, into performing certain rituals, opening a certain box, getting rid of something else, in order that the jinn can suddenly... <laughs> burst out as a jinn and grabbed the beautiful woman whom Abu Muhammad was thinking. Yes, that, yes, mm. illusions do happen. Um, they're, they're not so prominent. I'm, I'm trying well, to in the city of Brass, the, when the travellers arrive at the city mm. of Brass, they see illusions of beautiful women. Uh -huh. And so they all try to scale the walls to get to the beautiful women. But the beautiful women are simply phantoms that have been conjured by the jinn who are protecting the city. And so all the people who swarm over at the orders of, the, of their leaders are just fall to their deaths in the city. And they have to, in the end, mm. do something. They, they conjure up, they, they meet that old wise man who tells them how to do it, how to get into the city. 
I, the, the great tale about illusions being conjured up is in this army's seven pavilions, which is a Persian work of literature, where there's well, a man out in the desert, I forget the story in any detail, he encounters a beautiful oasis in the palace and so on, and it turns out to be an illusion, and then he's in what he thinks is the real world, but that too turns out to be an illusion, and then, and so it goes and goes. Um, a constant series of deceits, many veils of mm. Maya, um, mm. before he finally reaches some mm. kind of enlightenment. Mm. But the Arabian Nights is not quite like no, that. No. Yes, at the back. Um, thank you very much. At the risk of um, your answer being buy the book and read it. Um, I just wondered if you could say something about music um, in this new volume, because music plays an interesting role in the Arabian Nights, mm. and I wondered whether it was equivalent um, or different in any way. Uh, it does, there are stories in the Arabian Nights where the whole point is music, aren't there? Isak al Mosuli and, and, and some other people, musicians primarily. Uh, less so here. I, the most interesting reference to music is in the tale of Julianar of the Sea and her son Badr, uh, where Badr is uh, sort of held, detained by a sorceress. I think it's Queen Lab, and Queen Lab has her women play music uh, and sing, and um, he's quite entranced by that. And he, then she sort of says, "Well, this is nothing," and she dismisses them and summons Automata from the war to play and sing even more beautifully than the, the living slave girl she's just dismissed. But no, there isn't anything much, you, you couldn't write a, a, even as much as a short article on music and tales of the marvellous, unless I'm missing something. Well, well I think that the uh, poetry, which um, um, ah, yes. that, I think that does actually um, perform a musical function. Yes. It's very like opera. I mean, it's basically the pause and the aria, and you don't, you know, so then the action is the restative, and then you have a pause, and and, and the passions, and sometimes the comedy, comes through that. I mean, you know, there's, there's an earnestness in the lyric, love lyrics, but, but it's so extreme that there's almost a sense of, you know, pushing against earnestness. I mean, you're almost spilling over into this, you know, a, 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 a sort of place on the edge, on the edge of, of, of seriousness. And, 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 I, and I actually like, I have to make myself do it in a similar way that I had to make myself read Antonia Byatt's poetry in Possession. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you sort of wish to skip because you think you want to get on with the story. But actually it performs a function that deepens and stretches the emotional texture of the book. And that's very true, I think, of the, of the poetry in, in both the Arabian Nights and in this, in this volume. And it's where I think the orality comes through. And it's very cadenced. I mean, the... Um, you know, the, it's very cadenced. And, uh, of course, M Milan's has done a very good job, but you know, Arabic poetry is very prosodic. So that's why the content is so repeti repetitive, because actually it's the ingenuity of the shifts and changes, which, is, again, is very musical. And then just an afterthought, if Sul and Shumul was being told orally, then it's quite likely that every time the poetry comes mm. up, and it comes up a lot, yes, then somebody sorry. would have an ood yeah, yeah, and actually yeah. sing the stuff, and that yes, would carry yes. the story along quite And actually, bit. sorry, one other point about it, which I like very, very much, is that this, this, this poetry is carried on the voice of women very frequently. Mm. So there's, uh, whereas in, there's no fairy tale I think, that I can think of in which a woman actually, a, a female heroine, writes poetry, in both the Arabian Nights and here, they constantly are mistresses of poetry. Song and poetry. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I was just wondering about um, children um, in the tales and Arabian Nights, because um, obviously with the Western kind of fairy tales and things, um, and I didn't know how they kind of viewed children or what this text might be. That, that's kind of interesting in a way, in a completely negative way. Uh, Western fairy tales quite often have children, Hansel and Gretel, uh, Red Riding Hood, the, mm. the Snow Queen. Um, there are no child protagonists in the, the, the Arabian in Tales of the Marvelous at all. Um, the only sort of references you get to children is somebody praying for a child. But the, the, the next paragraph on, the child is grown up and that's it. The, the, it's <laughs> one sign among many that these stories are not for children. But I think they can be read. You would have to be quite a good reader. So you're not, you've got to be at least 10, I think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but they're not, I mean... They're probably unsuitable compared to, you know, other things. But they they, they have this exuberant. Mm -hmm. Any real ch child who really loves reading would 
would get lost in this, would like, like it. I mean, I read lots of unsuitable things. I didn't even notice they were unsuitable. You know, I mean, that's one of the things is that... Um, in the context of the discussion tonight, um, at the end of your introduction, you describe it as uh, pulp fiction. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more? Mm. Well, I, I meant that to be a compliment. I, I'm very fond of pulp fiction. I, I like <laughs> Sax Roma. I like Ryder Haggard, which I regard as pulp fiction, though rather superior. I like Dennis Wheatley. You know, I, it's got that feeling of here's a real story. Let's not bother too much about being intellectual or pious or anything. Things are going to happen. I, I like that. I think that's all I wish. And um, yeah, it, it's literature, but it's aimed at people who want to be entertained rather than instructed, I think. Okay. Is that... There's one, there's a question there, yes. We've got... A... Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was wondering about what you said about uh, the moral thrust of the stories. And I know you were saying that um, there's a difference, you think, in, in Arabic literature, in that magic is kind of seen as, in a way, less, less evil, or kind of, and that, um, that these fairy tales, are you, you called them immoral, but then you also called them pious. So I was wondering if you thought oh, yes. that there was a a moral thrust to these stories. I mean, mm. what, what does that involve? And could it be compared to, how can it be compared to kind of Western fairy tales, which, which often have a kind of a fable or a, or a moral purpose? I'll do first and then you. Um, uh, th yes, there's a whole aspect to this that haven't come. Not all these stories, but many of them are, ex quite a majority of them, I think, are explicitly described in the original Arabic contents as Faraj bad ashida, uh, relief after grief, and the point, it's a whole, again, it's a genre in Arabic literature. If you stick with things, if you keep your faith with God, no matter what troubles beset you, things will work out. Just have faith. So the stories that end happily, and the man sort of prays to Ali, or prays to God, uh, and things turn out well, this, this it has a pious lesson, and indeed some of these stories are found in anthologies devoted to Faraj Badashida, Relief After Grief. Um, well, there's a sort of difference that's quite fundamental between fairy tales in the West, in the Europe, and, um, and that is that the cosmology of the fairy tales, though they might have once been connected to people's beliefs, and indeed in some parts, I mean, even in 19th century in Ireland, there were some outbreaks of rather serious crises around fairy beliefs. Mm -hmm. On the whole, fairy beliefs are distanced from religion. They just don't belong in the same sphere. And that was something that fairy tale used. It used the cloak of its sort of unbelievability to say various things. Whereas when, when, when Robert says that there's a pious element, mm -hmm. that's because the cosmology is actually coherent with the religion. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to believe in fairies. No. Whereas in the Quran, it says there are jinn, and yes. these are the things that jinn do. Yes. Any, any more questions? If, uh, if not, yes. Well, that's, and then I think I'm a, then we can have a drink, and you can talk to Robert as much as you want, I think. And Marina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you were mentioning in the stories about the, uh, the statues coming to life and so on, um, and the automata and, and the... Uh, the, the phobias uh, uh, surrounding that. I mean, is that relatable to what we've been uh, so, uh, um, uh, so, you know, read about so much recently in relation to uh, uh, representations in Islam of, of the prophet and even uh, the, the, the human form? Is there a connection in those stories between a kind of uh, more general iconophobia? Um, all sorts of things to be said there. Um, firstly, the idea that you, you mustn't represent living things, um, and particularly not Prophet Muhammad, is very questionable. And what the Quran says is you shouldn't create images of idols. It's, it's not banning all forms of representation. Otherwise, you'd have to start smashing cameras and television sets, as well as tearing magazines to pieces. Um, secondly, it's been extremely common to represent the Prophet Muhammad in miniatures. There are 
hundred, no, mm. thousands of Turkish and Persian miniatures featuring the Prophet. It, it, it's, it's a Wahhabi invention. It, it's a relatively recent heresy that you mustn't represent the Prophet visually. Um, then there's this business of yeah, fear of statues. Um, two things going on. It's very noticeable, even as late as Evliya Chelebi, the Turkish traveller writing in the 17th century, it does seem as though Muslims, when they're writing, have great difficulty coming to grips with the idea of statues as work of art. Uh, if, as far as Evliya Chelebi is concerned, if you see a man of stone, it, it's either a wonder-working talisman there to defend something or other, a treasure or, or, or city walls or something, or it's somebody who's been petrified and turned into stone. <laughs> and that's the kind of mentality you get in Tales of the Marvellous. Um, and there's this strong sense of um, the, the world now, as far as the 10th century or this goes, is relatively sane and not supernatural. The marvels belong to the past. It's the past that has all this stuff, all these extraordinary things. That was when things really happened. And, and the statues are one of the many evidences of... It, it, Science fiction for the medieval Arab is something that happened in past centuries. It happened under the Byzantines and under the Sasanians and other lost dynasties. Well, I think with that rather wonderful image, mm -hmm. um, we should all thank Robert very, very much for, for his...